Let's hop into Article 1, mind-controlled robots. So this, this was really interesting to me. It's coming out of EPFL. Um, the TLDR is that they've built a system where a user's thoughts can be used to control a robot. Now, th this isn't like super new. We've, we've seen a lot of like uh, topics like this before. Uh, we talked about when, when we had our Neuralink episode, we talked about um, an implant in a monkey that could play Pong with its mind. Yeah. I think back in 2011, there was a paraplegic patient. Some, I forgot which university it was, but they were also doing something similar where it was like using their um, output, the signals from their brains to translate what words they want to say. But here's why this one is interesting. So they, they, it's, it's a two-part secret sauce that controls this robot. Is it spicy? And I think so. I mean, I, I like spice, so in, in my perspective, it is spicy. Um, and what, what they really want to do here is that they took a robotic arm that they had developed some years ago at EPFL, and it's, they wanted to take the input from the user of that's right or that's wrong mm -hmm. for the robot to realize what it is doing is right or wrong. And I, I'm, I'm going to try to explain this the best I can. Because what we've talked a lot about in terms of machine learning has been reinforcement learning, right? Yeah. That's when the system is supposed to figure something out and you've set up rewards for it. So like if the system is supposed to be a self-driving car, every time it doesn't crash, you give it a reward. And every time it stops at a stop sign, you give it a reward. So it keeps doing things over and over again to figure out what's good and what's bad. Yeah, I, th I think of it like training a dog. Like exactly. You, you give the dog a treat when it does something right. And that's how you teach it to do things the correct way. That's how reinforcement learning works, but with AI algorithms, right? When, when something's correct, you tell it what's up. And when something's wrong, you tell it what's in it's, it's an error, right? Right. But what they're doing here is a little different. It's called inverse reinforcement learning. And in inverse reinforcement learning, they're kind of instructing it in what the goal is. So in, I'm, I'm going to try to use the self-driving example again. They're saying you need to stop at the stop sign. So they're directly telling it that. Mm -hmm. But the way in which it does it could be different. So it could like be going 60 and then pressing on the brakes at the stop sign and going a little bit over, and that's an error. That's bad. Or it could just be moving super slowly, and that's bad too. So it's up to the user to tell the system of that's bad, that's bad, or that's good. Okay. What's interesting about this approach is that apparently it takes less tries to get it right. So in terms of using your mind to control the robot, it only takes three to five iterations for the robot to figure out the right path to take. So that's I, I wanted to lay the foundation moving forward for how this system is being approached and how it's a little bit different than the stuff that we've talked in the past. Is is the person's brain also giving that robot the goal of what to do? I don't think so, at least not yet. Okay, so we're just using the user's thoughts to correct the movement. As the error signal. Not not just providing the control signal as well. Right. Right okay. now, it's just the error signal. And so... But the, I guess we, we've seen research in the past where the brain can be used for control signals, so they're just adding an extra layer on top of that, I guess. Right, so like going back to the example of Pong or like to the example of saying a word and having that word be recognized, or even if you remember with Neuralink, the demonstration they did where the implant from uh, the pig's mind, you could see where it wanted to move its left leg. You could see spikes in yeah. it, right? So th that's definitely there. And now they, they want to get those error thoughts. Like apparently it's just a singular signal. So translating that was a huge challenge for them because they had to translate that error signal into the different um, control schematics of the robot yeah. to do something. I mean, this is this is incredible to me. This, just for reference, I've, I've worked on a project before like this where we used EEG headgear to control a game of Pong, like very similar to this monkey playing Pong with the Neuralink implant. But the only way we were able to get it to work is like it took a lot of recalibrating. And the only way we were able to get it to work is like you move your right arm to move this thing up and you move your left arm to move the paddle down. And that, that's not really complex enough um, for, you know, something as, you know, finessed as like holding a spoon and eating, eating uh, soup out of a bowl or something right. like that. Um, and We've seen technology advance to the point where people have controlled robotic arms that do that. But I can't even imagine the amount of calibration it took and training for the person and training for the robot to get it to a point where they can coexist in a point where they're like, when I tell the robot what to do, it understands what I want and it does it properly. 
this seems like it is shortening that feedback loop to the point where like in two or three tries, it's getting it correct as opposed to spending hours and hours of time of training for the person and for the robot to figure out a way for, you know, to, to do things properly. You're right. And it, it's from my understanding, from what they were showing in the video, it's almost become like a seamless interaction. So the user, like you said, is wearing the EEG headgear, which is picking up the signals of their brain. And for this demonstration, they're using a six degree of freedom access robot to avoid a glass. So it's moving fast or moving slow or moving too far away or whatever. And the, the, the user is just thinking of right or wrong, and then it finally gets it right. What's interesting is that apparently the same principle can be used for a robot that is pouring water, that is feeding you, that is doing anything. And it's so seamless, again, that it gets it right within five tries in the maximum from what they reported. But that that's not like, that's a feat of engineering in itself. But that, that wasn't the most impressive thing to me. Wow. <laughs> the most impressive thing is the next steps. So this already, what they've accomplished can make everyone's daily lives a little bit easier, mm -hmm. especially for patients that are paraplegic or te uh, tetraplegic. That's one of the things they mentioned. They can take care of themselves easier. The next up for them is a mind-controlled wheelchair. So, um, wow. yeah, like uh, you took controls. I took controls. That, that seems like an insane problem it, as it is. And now you have a patient that is moving, a lot of you know brain signals going off. You need to filter that to determine, is the wheelchair moving right in your opinion, yes or no, and feed it into the wheelchair in real time and get it to course correct. So that's the next thing that they're tackling with the same idea and principles that they've established here. I mean, it, it, this is like taking it from a level where I'm like, yes, I understand this biomedical engineering yes, I've done this before, like, wow, this is impressive. And now I'm like, we're living in a sci-fi movie. Right. Um, just the, just to think about like when you're engineering or designing a control system, right, you have to focus on the consequences of the bad outcome, right? The consequences of a bad outcome from a robotic arm, um, you know, pouring a glass of water, like it sucks that it spills the glass of water in the patient. And you don't want to do that a tons of times because it's really, really frustrating to be, you know, splashed with water every single time you try to drink out of a cup. But all in all, the consequences of that are pretty low. Like, it's like just minimal. Ch yeah, change your clothes, whatever. But a mind-controlled wheelchair, if they feel confident enough to apply this technology there, this is them saying that they have enough confidence in the control system that this wheelchair can drive around controlled by the mind and not crash and kill the person or not crash and kill someone else or injure someone else or damage things. I mean, this is, you know, when you see technology get a, uh, deployed in higher-risk situations, it means that they have higher control and higher confidence in their ability to execute. Absolutely. And what, what I loved about this is that there's two different labs at EPFL that's actually like working on this research. One of them is the brain machine interface laboratory. So again, that those are the folks looking at the brain to signal translation side. Mm -hmm. And then you have the learning algorithms and systems laboratory. So that's the algorithm that's going to work with the robotic system or the wheelchair to make everything work together. Yeah, I've never so, really thought about, you know, machine learning being used in this type of application. But it it's like a whole new world for me, just opening my mind around just thinking about how many hours we spent in this project team trying to get, you know, so just to control a pong paddle going up and down. Um, and only one person in our group could do it successfully. And, you know, all those hours spent into that and then trying to do something as complex as driving a wheelchair using your mind and that they feel confident to do that. And the key that's unlocking it is using machine learning with inverse reinforcement learning to figure it out. You know, it's a testament to how far we've come with technology and what a great spot we we are in right now for all these amazing research and advancements that we're seeing. And this one actually hits home for me because I have a loved one who has spinal cord injury. So I could see how this technology could directly impact and make their lives better. Yeah. So in, in this realm, I'm super excited about this, dude. And if we've come, you know, when I don't know when you did this project. Imagine how, how far we've come in the past couple of years, how much further we're going to go in the next few. Yeah, I mean, we we've gone from like students playing pong with with an EEG headset to monkey playing pong with a Neuro, Neuralink implant to like people being able to regain their independence to move around and to do actions around the house and only have to use their brain to do it. And in a way that's not frustrating to them, the robot understands it in only a few tries. I mean, this sounds like we're technology is becoming mature enough in the space where it can truly start to impact some people's lives and improve it. Absolutely. Absolutely.